Thank you. Thank you for coming out on what seems to be a very blustery night, you know, standing outdoors, this wind coming from the Jersey Shore is chilly, but it's actually more chilly up in Plattsburgh, 300 miles to the north, so I'm enjoying the warmth, okay? Uh, as Carol mentioned, I'm going to be talking about South Street Seaport, so situate yourself a mile to the east, because when you think about Fulton Street from the Trade Center all the way out to the East River, it's about a mile. So uh, I'll be talking about the last, say, half century of the district. As was mentioned, this goes back to a 2014 book published by NYU Press. Uh, as was mentioned also, as uh, I am a historian of the historic preservation and history museums in the United States, and I've got an informal series called Preserving America's Past. So the book on South Street is the third one, and as I'll tell you later, I'm about ready to finish the fourth one in the series. Uh, let's push ourselves back to the late 1950s in New York. Uh, on the left, you can see, again, a, a photo of memories of the Battery, everything south of, of the Canal Street. Uh, this area in 1958, 1959 was thought to be dying. Uh, it was called a wasteland. Uh, in 1958, the Downtown Lower Manhattan Association developed, and it pretty much wanted to clear cut a wide swath from river to river in order to rejuvenate downtown. Uh, at this time, there were 400,000 workers coming into Lower Manhattan, but only 4,000 residents. And the, push, the person pushing the change was David Rockefeller. Now, on the other slide, you can see, oops, 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 sorry about that. On the other slide, you can see uh, the East River here. And where I'm discussing is, again, South Street Seaport. So here's the Brooklyn Bridge coming across. And here's the Fulton Fish Market. Here's South Street going up. This used to be the old maritime district, sailor town, uh, bars, boarding houses, brothels, you name it, whatever is associated with sailors. And the whole idea was to somehow change the image of New York. Uh, the image was going to dramatically change, as you can see, in 1960, David Rockefeller proposed building the World Trade Center right here on the Hudson. So this would have been the Trade Center, a 70-story hotel next door, and a World Trade Mart. Uh, it was going to be funded by the Port Authority, and as all you know, Port Authority is not just New York, it's also Jersey. And so the governor of New Jersey demanded that the World Trade Center be pushed a mile to the east so it could connect with the tunnel that was already existing there. West. West, West. okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, also occurring at the same time was the proposal for a major uh, expressway across Manhattan. Uh, the cross Manhattan would have been uh, 10 lanes across raised, it would have destroyed neighborhoods from Soho on uh, the west all the way to uh, Chinatown on the east. Uh, the expressway was being pushed by the man on the left, Robert yes. Moses. Uh, as A. Louise Huxtable told me, again, you know, there's a good Moses, no John Beach, there's a bad Moses. And he was the one responsible for so much of the destruction associated with all the interstates going through. Robert Moses' chief uh, foe was, again, as you see on the right, Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs had just come out in 1961 with a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. It's been called perhaps the most important book ever written on America's urban scene. Jane Jacobs lived in the West Village and she wanted to protect her neighborhood. She rallied the people against the expressway. And so what we see with Jane Jacobs is the ability to muster the ranks, pull people into protecting their city, protecting their neighborhoods. The neighborhoods I'm talking about tonight are, again, right in the shadow. You can see the Brooklyn Bridge coming up here. Two neighborhoods, Brooklyn Bridge Southwest Urban Renewal Zone and the Brooklyn Bridge Southeast. The Southwest is everything west of Pearl Street. It's 27 acres or so. It was essentially clear-cut, bulldozed, wrecking ball, and it was replaced by, well, downtown Beekman Hospital, by Pace, it was college back then, and a lot of residential high-rises. South Street Seaport's going to be worried about Brooklyn Bridge Southeast, and so it's 38 acres, including the piers, 
uh, 38 acres on the uh, east side of Pearl Street. You can see some of those buildings in southeast zone. Again, they're kind of charming commercial structures, turn of the century perhaps. Uh, Victorian, Arcane, you can see again along that facade there. Uh, many, Amer many New Yorkers were shocked by what was proposed. Uh, NISCA, the New York State uh, Council of the Arts, uh, sponsored a photo exhibition, and this is what is shown here. It's called The Destruction of Lower Manhattan. It shocked New Yorkers. It shocked New Yorkers to see so much of their heritage being demolished. And this wasn't just down in Lower Manhattan. This was across the board. And so we see the preservation movement slowly rising in, the, uh, in anticipation of trying to protect the past. What I'm talking about is we call South Street Seaport today, but back then it was called Fulton Fish Market. Fulton Fish Market goes back to early 1820s, <coughs> and in many ways it's the mercantile commercial center of old New York, which was at that time situated on the East River. Uh, as I mentioned, the principal occupant was the fish market. And here we got this a kind of charming picture of Bobby Kennedy <laughs> running for the 1964 uh, Senate slot in New York, and he's chatting with some fishmongers right there. The thing about the fishmongers is they are influenced by the mafia. The unions are controlled by the mafia. And so there had been a plan to break the mafia by moving the fish port out. Uh, in 1950s, the plan was to move them to the Bronx, and that's eventually what's going to happen. And so we have this goal that is going to occur of somehow revitalizing Lower Manhattan by urban renewal. The preservation movement uh, has a lot of origins, but many trace it to the demolition of Penn Station. Uh, again, it was given its sense of death in 62 or so, and as you look at Penn Station, this grand concourse was this, this amazing entryway into the city, an entrepot, as you call it. Uh, McKim, Mead, and White going back to the early building of the 20th century. There was an organized resistance to the demolition. And here you can see, again, the, the, the protesters. They're not a grubby sort. These are guys and gals in suits and, and again, fine dress leading the protest uh, right here. If you follow architecture, this is Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson was the leading modernist of the time. Right next door to him is Eileen Saarinen. Her husband, Aero Saarinen, had just died. Here's Jane Jacobs, and here's Ray Rubenau, who was the head of the Kaplan Fund, which is going to be the principal backer of the Seaport Museum in its early years. And so the demolition of Penn Station took three years. They had to keep the railroad running underneath. And so it's a long, drawn-out process. Many New Yorkers asking, what do they want their future to look like? That future is going to be shaped partly by Mayor Wagner, as you can see here, strengthening the preservation law. One law is already in the books. In 65, he strengthened it somewhat. And that's going to be the makings of New Yorkers' attempt to save their past. Um, at the same time it was occurring, in 1966, you can see President Johnson signing, 50 years ago, signing the, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. That established the National Register, it established the State Historic Preservation Offices, and it finally began to coordinate federal programs, federal departments, so that they are concerned about preservation. Uh, it's a milestone. It is the milestone in the 20th century when it comes to preservation. The Seaport Museum was actually influenced by what was going on in San Francisco at the time. Uh, Carl Corbin had founded a museum there in 1951. He had overextended himself and he persuaded Sacramento, the state, to establish right next door a state maritime park. So what we have here is a private-public partnership. And that's going to be the model for South Street Seaport. Carl Corbin is, uh, is probably the greatest preservationist when it comes to maritime in the 20th century, and I'm writing about him right now. The seaport actually is founded in 66 by this man here and his wife, Peter Stanford, and Norma Stanford. Peter was an insurance executive, excuse me, an advertising executive, committed to uh, shipping, uh, yachting, maritime culture, and he is the one who is going to get the museum going. At the same time, what occurs, you can see here on the right, Here's Carl Cordham, I just mentioned him from San Francisco, but here is Whitney North Seymour Jr. 
Whitney North Seymour Sr., who at one time was a president of the Municipal Art Society. He was a prominent lawyer across the nation. Uh, Whitney North Seymour had just been elected to the New York Senate from that side of the island in, in early 1966. One of his first pieces of legislation was to establish the New York State Maritime Museum. So that's this NYSMM. Uh, the bill sailed through Albany, and then it hit a roadblock with Governor Rockefeller. Rockefeller said, I will not pass it unless there is no funding. So the New York State Maritime Museum bill passed, but there was no money involved, which means nothing happens there. There was no money involved because David Rockefeller, Nelson's brother, had different plans for that side of, <laughs> of lower Manhattan. Okay? Now the original point of Southridge Seaport was somehow to create the street of ships going back to the mid-19th century. And so you can see this image on the left. You can see the bow spritz of those ships coming across South Street. You can see the mercantile businesses, again, the buildings. You can see the hubbub on the street. This was when New York was, again, this rising port, major port in the country, and soon to be the major port in the world. Uh, you can see an art architect's illustration here of what the proposal would look like. You can see, in many ways, the ships. You can see restored buildings. But what's not shown is that there were also plans to put high rises here because the only way Rockefellers would support it is if there was ways to put people there to uh, take care of Wall Street's residences, okay? Uh, so what we have by 1968 is this uh, Brooklyn Bridge Southeast Urban Renewal Zone, and the Seaport Museum is the sponsor chosen by the city. It's the sponsor, but it is unassisted, which means the Seaport Museum is expected to raise its own money, a difficult feat. Now, if you follow, again, politics, this is what we call neoliberalism taking on a, an agenda of reform, but making it paid for by private sources. And so we have the Seaport Museum as a sponsor of this urban renewal zone, but it somehow has to pull the money together itself. Now, one of the early friends of the Seaport Museum was a person on the, on the left here, A. Louise Huxtable, uh, probably the most important preservation writer in the late 20th century. She was one who's the first full-time uh, New York Times architecture critic, later Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Huxtable particularly was interested in the seaport because what she loved to see, and this is Skimmerhorn Row, she loved to see what was essentially human scale, red brick buildings with these glass uh, skyscrapers behind them. She loved the contrast. She loved streetscapes too. So she rejected what was standard for preservation back in those days, and we call it the connoisseur tradition. Before Huxtable, preservation were interested only in homes of important people or architecturally significant buildings. Huxtable wanted vernacular structures. This is vernacular every day. Scarborough Row goes back to 1811, 1812. It's a major building, but she, again, helped the preservation because she was trying to change how New Yorkers think of themselves as well. So she's going to be an invaluable friend when it comes down to the preservation. Uh, the question is, how are they going to raise the money? So here's Peter Stanford, the founder, but he corrals Jakob Isbrunson. Jakob Isbrunson was a maverick, a tycoon. He was a shipping baron. You can go up the Hudson, you can see in many ways one of the old covered docks was American Isbrunson lines. And so Isbrunson it was going to put his personal fortune behind the Seaport Museum. He's going to be made the major philanthropist behind it. He begins to buy buildings, okay, and I'll talk about this in a second, but you can see what Front Street looked like back before the restoration. Incidentally, this building here is Chase Manhattan, built from 56 to 61. It's the first modern skyscraper in lower Manhattan since the 1920s. So David Rockefeller put his money, his own money, on the line. He's investing in Lower Manhattan, and in many ways, he is going to be the one pushing so much of development. So East Brunson, the shipping tycoon, and David Rockefeller, both millionaires, trying to shape, new, uh, again, Lower Manhattan's future. So by 66, what we have happened is the Seaport Museum is established here, okay? 66, we start to see the World Trade Center go up. 
is going to be topped out in 1973. So these two institutions are going to grow at the same time, opposite sides of, of again, Lower Manhattan. They are, as I say, the kind of the yin and the yang. They're opposite but contributive in many ways. And we're going to see their fortunes, unfortunately, are tied together too when you look at the end of the 21st century. Okay? One of the goals of the Seaport Museum was to pull people just down to Lower Manhattan. Jane Jacobs had this wonderful phrase, putting eyes on the street, people down walking Lower Manhattan. It was thought to be dangerous back then. One of the people who brought people was Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger held his first concert there, free concert, a free concert in 67. He drew 3,000 people to the streets of the seaport and again sang in many ways and this is going to be a tradition over the next five or so years. He also brings his, uh, again, recreated, you can see Hudson River Sloop, clear water to South Street. He sails this there to South Street Seaport in 69 and who is at the tiller? It's Mayor Lindsay. And so what we see is what you have is the Seaport Museum is adopted by the city because it's this rejuvenating force, pulling people down to lower Manhattan. And so what will happen, happen over this couple of many years is a question, how can the seaport, uh, again, uh, expand? Other programs, uh, shanty singing, folk singing, folk dancing, waterfront tours, all part of the program. Another part of the program was just to have people see the district. And so the district was unvarnished. The district was raw. But this is how Peter Stanford rightly saw history. It's not polished like you would get something in Colonial Williamsburg. It's in many ways a mix of old and dirty and thriving and dilapidated. And this is what they would start with. An example, though, of the change you can see with the bound print shop. It opened in 76. Mayor Beam was the one who again opened it officially. This is what it looked like before. This is like what it's after. This is still a seaport building today, and its future is, if I can get ahead of the story, its future is in doubt. Uh, as Carol mentioned, again, the, the, the Seaport Museum is a maritime museum. Stanford was most interested, first and foremost, with shipping. And so they brought 1960, uh, uh, 1968, as you can see, they brought the light ship Ambrose, which was the first gift. Ambrose goes back to when the Lusitania and Mauritania, these big Cunard liner ships were launched, and they need a bigger channel uh, getting out to uh, Paso Verrazano. So the light ship comes first, uh, again, the Gloucester fishing schooner, the Levy Howard comes after that. Uh, other, another schooner, Pioneer, comes in. You can see with the Trade Center behind it. The big catch, though, was Waver Tree. Uh, this is a three-masted uh, tall ship from, you can see, 1885 there. At this time, there are maybe two dozen such ships left in the world. There were tens of thousands of them at one time. Only a, couple, a dozen or so, two dozen or so, are actually left. Jakob Isfensen funded this and brought it to the seaport. That's the big catch here. Uh, so as I've shown, what's happening is the Seaport Museum is bringing people, it seems to be booming. Uh, Jakob Esprinson is helping by buying buildings. What occurs though is that the Seaport Museum has got a very weak financial base. The Seaport Museum was undercapitalized from the very beginning. And so as Jakob Esprinson bought buildings, 56 in total, his, again, capital was stretched. Now, if you follow New York real estate, you know there are booms and there are busts. And at that time, uh, the Seaport Museum was hoping to use the air rights over its historic district, sell those air rights, and make money to fund the museum. What occurred was the yin and yang, the World Trade Center began to come online. Too much office space, too little demand for that office space. The air rights were worthless. So Jakob Esprinson is going to face this crisis. He himself is going to face years of litigation going all the way up till today because he had collateralized his company, his fortune, and it was all, again, turning to dust. So the boom and the bust occurs in 73. 
Now, Lindsay, as I said, had banked on the Seaport Museum becoming this rejuvenating force in Lower Manhattan. Another person who banked on it, as I said, was David Rockefeller. David Rockefeller was pushing at the time a plan called Manhattan Landing, which would develop, kind of like Battery Park City here, a, con a similar concept over on the East River. As you know, some of you probably are from Battery Park Landing, and this is his brother who was the main sponsor of, of that development. So the Rockefeller brothers were, were again kind of invested on both sides of, of the island, but it all came to a crisis because in 73, Eastmanson's empire broke. The Seaport Museum looked like it would fail. And so in 1973, the city bailed out the Seaport Museum. All of Eastmanson's properties were taken by the city Okay, so the Seaport Museum originally wanted to be the owner, it became instead the late leaser, the leasee. And so after 73, what we're gonna see is New York State, New York, excuse me, New York City is gonna own those 56 properties in the Seaport District and lease them back to the Seaport Museum. And that's where the problem originates uh, with this, is with us today, okay? And so 1973 is kind of a turning point right there. After 73, there was a push to make the seaport commercially viable, to develop it, to get some income rolling in. And so you can see on this, on this drawing on the left, it was kind of small scale back then, but the hope was to pull money in in a very gradual type of restoration of the district. The centerpiece of the district, as I said before, Skimmerhorn Road, it goes back to 1811, 1812. It's going to be called the first World Trade Center of New York. It was. Okay. And so this is the centerpiece. Again, it was, again, housing fish operations at the time. It's, as I said, it's going to be bought uh, uh, by the city and then transferred over to New York State. Uh, so by the mid-70s, what you have, as I show, show here, it's a mix of private, museum, and municipal or government-owned properties. Uh, ships were the focus, though, still. Again, a, a big bark came in, uh, thanks to the Aaron family, back in 1975, as you can see. Here you can see the seaport at its height in 1976. This is for Operation Sail. Look at all the, the wharfs that are full of every type of either sailing or, again, diesel-powered uh, craft. This was the, the Seaport Museum at its height of, of, of success, height of popularity. You can see that with op sail. Uh, op sale was the way the nation celebrated its, its bicentennial, 200 years old. The whole focus of the United States is on the parade that occurs in New York Harbor. And as you can see from the Daily News headline, again, six million are watching it. It's the national pride. Again, a journalist, a TV anchorman, Walter Cronkite, is heavily involved in it. He's, again, a big promoter of the seaport. And this is, in many ways, what you should have as the, the height of popularity with the Seaport Museum itself. At the same time, the Seaport Museum was interested in telling New Yorkers about their history. And so what you have at the time is taking people to the streets, get them out of the classroom, get them interested in the, the city around them, a very active uh, uh, program to get people to appreciate the district. You can see the next generation of kids coming on board uh, the Ambrose, in this case, so education programs. New York State, as I said, had plans to develop the uh, Skirmerhorn Row as its own New York State Museum. This is the plans by, submitted by Giorgio Cavagliari. Cavagliari, as you may know, is the one who did the Jefferson Market Courthouse, became this wonderful New York City uh, library. He did the Astor Opera House, too. Uh, if you look at this drawing, you can see it's a very maritime setting. Bollards, okay? Uh, paving stones, no greenery, it's a port. And so the idea was to emulate the old port of yesteryear. Uh, here's the back side, the Burling Slip or John Street side. The building to note, oh, 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 sorry about that. The building to note is this one here, New York State plan to build a visitor center. Every museum needs a turnstile. It needs some way to get money coming in from those who visit it. And New York State realized this. The problem with New York State is that it's going to go through its own shaky economics. If you remember the New York City in the 1970s as a result of Lindsay's overspending, 
Same thing happened in New York State. And so both city and state are going to be stretched economically by the uh, post-Vietnam War recession, stagflation, the troubled times of that era. Now this is the corner line. I'm going to come back to this in a minute too because that is where this visitor center is supposed to be. Uh, let's see what happened here. Let's see. Okay. Let there be lights. So by 1977, you got the historic district. The historic district is 10 blocks. The post office was that sh uh, red shaded one. Take note that what you have with the historic district is this area that's not included. That's the point of controversy when we get to 2012, 13, 14. So can we remember that? But everything shaded in red right there, you can see, is the historic district itself. Right? Ah, oh. oh, you gotta have thin fingers to work this machine, I suppose, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, New York City, New York State want to develop the Seaport District. And the person they turn to is James Rouse. I'm not sure if you know anything about James Rouse's history. He had a, a legacy of failed suburban shopping malls, okay? A business failure. And then, all of a sudden, he decided to go opposite, and he was impressed by Beardary Square, in San Francisco, which was Carl Cordon again at work. Uh, Rouse went into uh, Boston, developed Quincy Market, three phases, 76, 77, 78. So the first success of Quincy Market is 76, and that's when he begins to rise. He's a close friend of Jim Shepley. Jim Shepley is the head of Time Magazine, and that's why he's <laughs> on, on, on the cover right there, okay? Shepley is the pusher of a commercialization of the district, again, to capitalize it. So New York State is pushing, uh, New York City is pushing, Shepley and the board of the museum are pushing to capitalize it. And so in 1977, uh, Rouse does a, a, a study, a study to see if it is possible. And he says, yes, this could be made into a festival marketplace. Now, once that was announced, all hell broke loose because so many people in the city were suspicious. They said it's not New York. They said in many ways it just doesn't fit. They said all the, uh, the predictions were exaggeration. And so what you see happening is from 77 when the, uh, the study is done through the next four years we have a tremendous amount of hype. Uh, again manufactured to promote the acceptance of this uh, festival marketplace. And that hype is going to be led by this man right, up, 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 this man right here. This is Jim Shepley. Uh, what occurred at the Seaport Museum was a split. They developed a real estate arm called the South Street Seaport Corporation. And Shepley is the head of that. He's pushing the commercialization. And so they lead to a deal, a deal in 1981 for a lease. Here you got the signing ceremony shortly after in 82. And this is the deal that is still the point of controversy today. Because according to the deal, what occurs is that James Rouse is the developer, again, going to develop properties. I'll show those in a minute. And the developer promises such a windfall that this money is going to be used to finance and fund the museum for years to come. Predictions go as high as $20 million a year in profits going to the Seaport Museum. All right? It's all hype. And I'm going to show you how tragically it follows through. And so this 1981 lease, signed in 82, is going to be the issue all the way up till today. The first stage of this is the development of the new Fulton Market, opens in 1983. Uh, you can see the man on the victory parade, Mayor Koch. He was the principal promoter of it. The parade started on the Hudson River and went all the way down Fulton Street. It was like a coronation ceremony for Mayor Koch. He called it the most important development happening during his tenure as mayor. And so he's going to have his personal reputation uh, behind this as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, the seaport was popular, it seems. Anytime something makes the cover of the New Yorker, you know it has to be hitting a trend. And so what you see happening with the seaport itself is they got the new Fulton Market. Oops, oops, oops. You got the new Fulton Market right there on the left. It's a bunch of eateries, okay? At the right, you've got Skirmerhorn, 
skirmer horn row, okay, and that's going to be the initial draw. Uh, there was controversy from the start about skirmer horn row because this may look like it is dilapidated and worn, and it was, but the verdict from again. Um, uh, Paul Goldberger of the Times, again, Jane Colts K of the Boston Globe, the verdict was it's over-restored. It looked like it was brand new. And so there's a whole question about how far should restoration go, and that is a question going up till today, too. Uh, to give you an example of Front Street, here is the, the, the slide I showed you before. Here's what it looks like after. It's a little more respectable, but still part of this whole attempt to bring people down to uh, the Seaport District and more in many ways to revitalize its commercial economy. Okay. The second phase is going to be the building in 1985, the finishing of Pier 17, Mammoth, Ball, Mammoth Mall. Uh, ben Thompson is the architect for this and his other lifetime achievements. He received the American Institute of Architects Gold Medal Award making him essentially equal to Frank Lloyd Wright, the best of the bunch, right? He took a lot of pride in this building because it was very maritime. -y. Remember that because I'm gonna show you what is now replacing it. And so this is supposed to look like a maritime shed and the idea was to continue a maritime tradition right there. Now what happened is once this mall opened, it was immediately popular, 86, 87, by 88, South Street Seaport is the most popular tourist destination in New York City. More than the statue, more than the Trade Center, it had boomed, but then it plateaued and came down, okay? Now, because of that shift, all the promises made to the Seaport Museum about the funds it would earn came to nothing. In fact, a nickel didn't even go to the Seaport Museum for the development. And this is the tragedy. So whenever, again, developers promise, 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 we all should be very careful about listening and believing that, okay? As a result, with no money available, the ships suffered. And so what you see happen is the waiver trees, waiver trees uh, crews laid off, one member is in the, in the audience today. The Daily News did a, a story, the, the most the seaports never covered in 1989. And it was a shocker to many in the city that the Seaport Museum ships had been deteriorating so much so fast and were in such lousy condition. That's because no money was available, okay? Uh, by 1985, the museum was, as the president, Peter Neal said, intellectually and financially bankrupt. It was desperate. And it was in many ways years of an inability to finance itself being the number one problem, but a temporary solution came with the Aaron family. Uh, Jack Aaron's company, J. Aaron and Company, big on Wall Street, sold to Goldman Sachs, a lot of millions as a result of that, and the Aarons put millions into the museum itself. I asked Peter and his son how much, he would never tell me, but I estimate it's over 20 million bucks of the, of the family that went into the Seaport Museum. So you need a benefactor, okay? Still, the museum went on with education programs, programs to bring people down to the river to appreciate the maritime seascape that the East River offered, programs around the Fulton Fish Market. For example, these 6 a.m. tours were popular. Uh, Joseph Mitchell, the famous New York uh, writer, often led them, and again, it was real tradition, real history. Uh, the real history they, they showed also was, again, of sailors and workers. And so this is the whole trend in my profession, to show the many people besides just the merchants and the barons of capital. And so the South Street Seaport was trying to diversify its historical presentation. Uh, in 1998, you can see the South Street Seaport also succeeded with a, what we might call a parliamentary trick. Uh, if you remember Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, okay, powerful senator, he worked along with John Warner of Virginia, and they inserted late at night a clause in a defense appropriation bill, <laughs> naming the Mariner's Museum of, of Newport News, Virginia, and the Seaport as America's National Maritime Museum. 
And so you know, circumstances of, the, of, again, the designation don't matter as much as these now, museums were now recognized by the United States Congress as America's National Maritime Museum. Success followed, Letty, Letty Howard was restored, first one according to new standards. Uh, but all the while, the museum was losing its identity because of Rouse's attempts to pull more money into the district. Now, this is the logo. I'd like to show this because this is the private company of Rouse, okay? Take note how they appropriate the ship, they appropriate Skirmerhorn Row, they appropriate history in many ways to sell their own commerce, to sell their kitsch, to sell their whatever so they can make some money. And so the museum identity began to be uh, dissipated. Now, a little bit later, that, that loss of identity was really brought out by the bodies exhibit. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> seen it. It was a tragedy. It was so popular though. It opened in 2005 and attracted the throngs. And the question is, where did these poor souls come from? <laughs> Chinese political executions and so forth. But the point was that this exhibit in the New Fulton Market, right across from Skirmerhorn Row, was so popular, it was an embarrassment to the district. So this is an example of how the identity of the district is, is being lost, okay? Now, op sale 2000, Operation Sale came up. Now the Seaport Museum wanted to put Waver Tree out there. It participated in the parade, didn't technically sail, but Waver Tree is still the focus of the museum. Here we are, 2016, still the focus of the museum. So that was a success right there. Then comes 9-11. Uh, when I say it's unprecedented, that's putting it mildly, okay? Now the Seaport Museum is a mile down from the Trade Center. Again, this part of Manhattan, obviously much more impacted. But you have to remember what occurred at the Seaport Museum was partly a legacy of built up problems, but also an immediate loss of capital. Uh, by, 19, by 2001, the Seaport Museum relied 75% of its revenue on programs, school programs, elder hostel programs. Again, tourism, that all evaporated. For almost two years, there was no revenue. The city turned a cold shoulder to the museum as well. That's Mayor Giuliani. And if you want to ask me questions about him, I will be more candid, okay? <laughs> the Seabrook Museum tried to show, again, what, what again, was done with the, after the, the tragedy, and again, the evacuation of 300,000 folks from, from Lower Manhattan. But it was, in many ways, uh, the downhill skid of the museum in the years after, okay? Uh, as I mentioned before, Rouse is the, still the commercial developer, and the Seaport Museum has got Skirmerhorn Row. But if you look at Skirmerhorn Row, the museum has got the floors above the two first levels. The two first levels of Skirmerhorn Row are commercial, owned by the developer, released by the developer. The top rows is where, uh, the top stories is where the museum wants to develop its, its, its exhibit. Its first exhibit comes in 2003. A lot of controversy, but an extremely important topic, the Atlantic slave trade. It shows the po possibility that the museum can establish. If you go upstairs, you could see then a traditional museum, paintings and so forth. You can also see right on the walls of Skirmerhorn Road, graffiti in Gaelic from the workers of mid-19th century who came off the boats there, worked in the tea shop, in many ways were the backbone of building mid-19th century uh, Manhattan. The museum wanted to also develop a permanent exhibit on the Port of New York. So many New Yorkers come from elsewhere. They need to know about the history of the port. This would have been a good introduction. The museum wanted to focus also on making, the, the, making Waver Tree a sailing ship, U.S. Coast Guard certified. Uh, all the problems built to a collapse by 2004. And so it's probably 9-11. It's a lot of mismanagement that comes after Peter Neal leaves office. He leaves, okay? This mismanagement, if you want to ask me questions about that further, I'll be happy to answer them. But from 2004, it's been a, a downhill slide in the years right after that. Now, when the museum is so focused on its own problems, it can't be a steward for the district. And so we've got some very extravagant proposals of what to do with the waterfront. 
the successor to, to Rouse, General Growth, which is out of Chicago, uh, was pushing this building here, Cirque du Soleil, right there on uh, the East River, okay? Uh, what's uh, another building that was being promoted, as you can see by Santiago Calatava, is this gigantic cube, 850 or so feet high. If you follow the news, Santiago Calatrava just opened the Oculus at the World Trade Center, okay? Prominent architect, but when you think of this building right here, uh, it never happened, but the person who wanted the top condo had to have a lot of money, <laughs> 50 million or so, Mayor Bloomberg, okay? And so what we have are proposals for this, for this waterfront that were so contrary to the maritime na na notion. Okay, now this gives me an opportunity to explain the city's players. I don't know if you know much about NYC, EDC, the Economic Development Corporation. The Economic Development Corporation is in charge of managing city-owned properties. Its goal is to turn a profit. Its goal is economic development. Common Cause of New York, in fact, said that there was a licentious, their word, a licentious relationship between EDC and the real estate developers in town. EDC is very secretive. It's a public corporation. It doesn't really need or have to open its affairs to public scrutiny. And so it's going to be the one controlling the economic development. It's going to be the one that chooses Howard Hughes in 2010 as the developer there. Uh, ED, again, EDC is countered by, well, I kind of like to say David and Goliath. We got Goliath as the EDC, and the David is, again, the Department of Cultural Affairs. The Department of Cultural Affairs in the 90s again gave a, sub, a subsidy called operating support to every museum on city owned property, every museum except the Seaport Museum. And so it was openly discriminatory and it seemed to be hostile. And that's going to be a problem as the museum tries to cope with the disaster of, 2000, of 2001. Okay? While the museum was preoccupied with its own financial troubles, the city took back the lease for Pier 15, and they built this hodgepodge. And again, uh, Historic District Council said, why don't you just make it a wharf, a pier? And Mayor Bloomberg had gone in a different direction. In 2002, he began his esplanade on the East River, and this was one way to, in many ways, amplify that. This here is a so-called corner lot. Oops, sorry about that. The corner lot where there is still this question, and the EDC took that lease away also from the Seaport Museum. Uh, by 2010, again, as I say, Howard Hughes had come in as a developer, in 2011, the DCA, Department of Cultural Affairs, persuaded the Museum of the City of New York to step in, to manage the Seaport Museum. MCNY, you might know, is a private organization. It's, it was doing really well. It turned itself around. But the MCNY was only there for less than a year when Superstorm Sandy hit. And as you can see here, we've got seven to eight feet of surge. And so every first floor submerged. Now the museum on the third floor survived, but the bound shop of the Seaport Museum, its other, material, other, other properties were inundated. Now what you see happening is that because of Superstorm standing, there's no question of how is the district going to be back, brought back to normal, okay? Uh, after Sandy, you can see the museum is closed. There's a long period of trying to repair the storm damage, and this happens 2013 into 14. Okay, uh, Howard Hughes, as I said, came in in 2010. They began this, well, they call it a sea change, uh, which is a misnomer. They began, in many ways, pandering to the lowest element there. Notice how a real maritime scene is seen here in 1982. And what you have here with Howard Hughes, you've got AstroTurf. AstroTurf on Fulton Street. You've got picnic tables. You've got the kitsch at its worst. And the kitsch is hot dog stands and selling souvenir trinkets. Howard Hughes is just going for the proverbial bottom line. And you've got to remember, 
This is a New York State chartered history museum right behind it. And the contrast couldn't be more alarming than it was, okay? Uh, plan that Howard Hughes develops, okay? Take down Ben Thompson's award-winning maritime shed and put up this new mall. Uh, one of the members of the community board once said, it looks an awful lot like Las Vegas. Now, I don't know if you think New York City should resemble Las Vegas, but it was so out of character with the area. Right next door is the plan, as you can see here. Oops, sorry again. Right next door is the plan you can see for this tall high rise, okay? This is on that patch of land outside of the historic district. The historic district is controlled by the city. So we've got to remember, there is the state-defined historic district and the national. The city of New York refuses to recognize the state and national historic district, which includes this strip of land here, okay? It's the strip of land. And so New York City is the one at fault for the development because it let, it let EDC have its way and the whole idea is to finance as much return as possible. Okay? The most recent plan, and you might have seen this in the news, and this is where Santiago Calatrava proposed his 834-foot building. This is a 1,000-foot building right there on the same spot. Howard Hughes bought the property. They bought all the air rights that were available, and they are proposing this 200, this again, 1,000-foot uh, development. In two quick months, they flipped the package. They sold it to the Chinese. They made a cool $200 million in the transaction. And so this is going to be another, again, long, tall, high rise. I know the nature of the museum I speak at is one that is interested in skyscrapers. <laughs> but, you know, skyscrapers have their place. And you've got to remember that Mayor Bloomberg developed an $8 million, uh, again, playground right in the shadow of this over here, it's never going to see sunlight. And what you have is going back to Jack Yonassis' complaint. You know, how can you keep New York able to get some sunlight, particularly in days like this, when again the sun is low on the horizon. But this is the future that you're going to see ahead of us now, okay? Uh, the future of the seaport is in the hands of, oops, 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 fat finger there, okay. The future is in the hands of the uh, uh, uniform land use review procedure, which goes back to the 1990s. Every city property that's going through change has got to go through mandated review. And the question is particularly what's going to happen to Skirmerhorn Road. Community Board 1 led the demand that there be more public involvement. And Community Board 1 led to this demand for the creation of a seaport working group. Uh, you can see at the head of the table is Shelly Silver, <laughs> back in the good days, I suppose, okay. Uh, uh, again, council member Margaret Chin is right here, Sender Squadron's right there, borough presidents, Gail Brewer's right there, and here's the head uh, of CB1, Catherine Bray Hughes. Eleven meetings trying to hash out what should be the guidelines for developing the Seaport District. They came to four main conclusions. First, the Seaport Museum should be the focus of all development, its ships and its buildings. Secondly, they said that the historical qualities of the area must be respected. Thirdly, they said all development, neighbor development, has got to be contextual. And fourthly, they said the EDC has not shown the right sensitivity to the community, and there should be a new oversight body. Now, the thing is that the uh, Seaport Working Group could only recommend it with advisory. But Daniel Squadron, right here, the senator, said it's going to be the platform for all future change. And so this is what is with us right today. So as you start to think about Skimmer Hall Road, remember that graffiti, the graffiti that is, again, a real treasure of mid-19th century. Remember the Fulton Ferry Hotel, which is again on the, uh, the river side of Skirmerhorn Row, goes back to, in many ways, a seaport hotel. Its future is in doubt as well. Uh, the, uh, the future of the, of the area is also up to citizens groups. 
And so in, in the course of the museum's financial crisis, 2010 or so, we've got a group called Save Our Seaport, a parallel group, Friends of Save Our Seaport developed. We've got a lot of citizens who are trying to get not simply CB1, Community Board 1, but the Economic Development Corporation to listen. The museum's friends, the museum's workers, the museum's, uh, again, volunteers, are also an important constituency right there. I tell the whole story, obviously in a lot more detail, in the book, and uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's uh, one that I'm still doing some research because one chapter of the Seaport Museum is going to be the final closing chapter in the book I'm now closing up. I'm in the final stages of finishing a book called Preserving Maritime America. I deal with museums, well, kind of backwards, South Street Seaport, San Francisco Maritime, which is now a National Historic Park. I deal with, uh, again, uh, Mystic Seaport, some of you might have been there. Deal with Mariner Museum down in Virginia. And I begin with the New Bedford Whaling Museum and this, the first of the Maritime Museums going back to 1799 in Salem, Massachusetts. So it's my attempt in some ways to put museum history into the full flow of cultural history in America. So I thank you for coming out tonight. If you've got any questions, any questions? I'll be happy to. Questions? Yes. Um, in the um, late 60s and early 70s, there were two names, I believe, influential people at that time: Cantalupo and also the uh, tugboat. Company, Moran, I yeah, uh, okay. You did not mention them. Yeah, they're in the book. Joe Cantalupo okay. is a real charming character. He's real worthy. He, he had the, the garbage contract for the Fulton Fish Market. He had connections with the Mafia. He was not an associate of the Mafia. Joe Cantalupo is one who, who again provided kind of political coverage for museum in a Mafia controlled area. The Moran uh, Tugboat Company goes back, influential benefactors. They gave the museum a tug, it ended up in the Kingston Museum up further on the, on the Hudson. And so there's a lot of important uh, folks who were involved with the Seaport Museum, but unfortunately uh, would be here till tomorrow night if I, if I started talking about everybody, okay? Thank you for asking though. Yes? Yeah, hi. Um, are you familiar with the recent, uh, the federal program, Rebuild by Design, the dry line? Uh, no, is that what the I wonder how the seaport is going to fit into that. Okay. It's, uh, it's the federal plan to create a kind of post sandy uh, water. Yeah, plan. federal plans sometimes don't get off the drawing boards, too. And so New York City is the one to watch. And so I think Mayor Bloomberg's plan, going back to the Esplanade, might have started that. But you know, we're dealing now with a city that is facing potentially traumatic change when it comes to sea level. And how we're going to deal with that is, is the issue. And so you know, this talk might be just esoteric compared to more substantive problems with our environment. So I don't want to in many ways diminish what I said, but you know, again, how we can keep New York's seascape and waterfront in the course of this change that's a tough nut to crack. Thank you, though. Yeah. Other questions? No one asked me? Oh, go ahead. Hi, Jim. Uh, I'm a member of the second group that Jim, I say Jim because he came to us last year and did Happy a presentation. Happy to. Very kindly for us on the side. Um, I just wanted you to know that our little group got a Freedom of Information Act um, paper from um, the city, which I think they were very surprised that they actually gave us. And it was 400 pages that the Howard Hughes Corporation had given as a milestone to EDC uh, that was never public. And it was when they were telling Community Board 1 that they had absolutely no plans, that you know, they're doing everything bit by bit. They have 400 pages of plans, including uh, tearing down the market building, putting up a 10-story hotel that would be on the waterfront. You were just saying, we, we can't figure out how you can do this without the you know, federal guidelines. And just about everything else, taking over um, areas on Front Street, in other words, basically everything. Uh, and this was not supposed to be public, and it yeah. is public. And if anybody wants to read it, it's out there now. Yeah, I tell the story in the, in the chapter here. A good example, in 2013, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is rhetorically supporting the Seacourt. 
but at the very same time, he is undermining it. His Department of Small Business Services in June of 2013 offered Howard Hughes all the Seaport Museum property, offered it for 79 or so years. And so, you know, when you think about what, again, the mayor does, we like to have ones who are straightforward, but Mayor Bloomberg's Department of Small Business Services was going contrary to everything that he was saying about we need to support the Seaport Museum. And this gets to the question of development. And you know, obviously development is important for uh, de Blasio's administration. Somehow he's got to pay for the affordable housing. Somehow he's got to pay for all the promises that he offered. And this is why I think EDC has been given a real long leash, if a leash is at all the, the analogy. And so what we have in many ways is this legacy of mayor after mayor, going back to John Lindsay, again, rhetorically supporting the Seaport Museum, but at the same time dealing out cards that are very difficult for the Seaport Museum to play with. You know, today, as I mentioned, the Museum of City New York pulled out. They were there for almost 18 months. They pulled out because the EDC wouldn't change this 1981 lease. And the museum today has to, has to rest on like a stool, four legs. This is a standard procedure for museums. You've got to have, again, membership. You've got to have earned income. You've got to have philanthropy. And you've got to have municipal or state or federal support. A stool rests on four legs. And the Seaport Museum was in many ways and shaky and wobbly because it just didn't have those four stable legs. So any proposal today to talk about remaking that museum or any museum has got to deal with what we, we, we deal with in museum studies, these, these very basic rules of how a museum can financially survive. Um, another tough nut to crack, I suppose. Yes? Well, uh, what do you think about the deaccessioning of the ships and what's, what's that trajectory? Yeah, the, Peking is an example. Peking is a wonderful bark, over 300 feet long. Again, it's one of the biggest ships uh, in the world at the time. It came right before the bicentennial, a gift of the Aaron family. Uh, Peter Aaron realized that it just was too costly to maintain. And so early on in 2000, uh, you know, 21st century, 2002, they proposed selling Peking for $11 million. Uh, the Germans offered five, all right? The current chair of the Seaport Museum turned it down foolishly. Uh, Peking just sat there. And then the city decided it was going to give Peking away for free. And so next year, if the schedule goes according to plan, Peking is going to leave the Seaport Museum. It's been this, this fixture there since 75. It's, again, a magnificent bark. You know, four masts coming up. But it's going back to Hamburg because the German government gave 30 million euros to that museum to get Peking. And what about New York State? What about the US government? What about comparable efforts here? They just don't happen. And so deaccessioning is going to be a fact. Now, how, um, how to do it is the issue. Today, the Seaport Museum is going through a study to try and match up its program with its finances. And that is yet to be released. I'm waiting to hear what they say, because it might involve more deaccessioning. At one time, the Seaport Museum had the largest fleet of all museums in the United States by tonnage of historic ships. And that's come down, 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 because you know, as I said, you got to have four legs for a museum to stand on, and it came down to both public support and membership and earned income. It just didn't support it. So deaccessioning is, is an unfortunate fact, uh, downsizing, you can put it, but it is, I can't predict the future. If I did, I would be over on Wall Street buying some futures today, I suppose. <laughs> But it's going to probably happen further. Yes? I wanted to ask you about uh, the floating fish market and what some of the issues were in um, moving this mob control outfit uh, to the South Pole. 
I'm glad you asked that because that explains Mayor Giuliani's hostility. Giuliani is Italian, right? The, again, the mafia has got this terrible image for Italians. And Giuliani was pressing, pressing, pressing to get the Seaport Museum, the Seaport Museum Corporation, to control the mafia. Now, how can a puny little museum control this powerful organization? It just didn't happen. But Giuliani was one who pushed further, and he's the one to begin taking back the leases. The leases in 97 from the Seaport, from the Fulton Fish Market itself, other leases are going to follow. And so the Fulton Fish Market was long again planned by the city to move to the Bronx, and it always came down to the question of finances. Finally, the city couldn't affect that. It took the United States food and health programs to say the fish market, which remember it was the world's largest open air fish market. It didn't have proper refrigeration. It didn't have proper sanitation. And so the US FDA told the city it had to move and that's what finally brought it about. When it happened in 2005, the nature of lower Manhattan, particularly on the, on the East River side, changed dramatically. Now, you know, the fish market smelled uh, high heaven, and so you could notice that right away. But the whole culture that had been developing since the 1820s associated with that fish market was gone. Gentrification is going to be pushed rapidly as a result. Now, this is an issue, obviously, in not only this borough, but in neighboring boroughs today. Gentrification is a fact, and the city wants to push it because they need more income. But how much of, the, of history do we want to preserve at the cost of, in many ways, uh, these types of economic change? Um, it's another nut, tough nut to crack, OK? Other questions? I want to thank you for coming out tonight. I want, I want to thank you. Oh. Since all, most of the seats are full, let me welcome you all, especially anybody who's new to the museum. Who's new tonight for the first time? Excellent, terrific. Um, well, if you came because, uh, and obviously you did, South Street Seaport and the East River is, you know, your side of town. Welcome over here to the west side and the, the second seaport uh, of New York. Um, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder and director of the museum. And um, we here, uh, if you're not on our mailing list already, I hope by virtue of this evening and you're emailing us that you can stay alert to all the programs that we do here. Once a month we hold a program like this, which is a book talk. Um, we also do other kinds of programs, lectures by architects and walk, um, not walking tours, uh, curators tours and various other topics um, that we like to explore, especially on the history of New York, number one, but also on contemporary skyscraper and urban design. And um, I noticed everybody came to get their seats here at the beginning, but if you like, after the, the talk, please look around the exhibition, which is called Ten Tops. So it's not, it's 100 story buildings around the world uh, and what happens at the top of them. So it's not a top 10 list, it's a 10 <laughs> tops list. Um, and, uh, it's only up through March uh, 13th, so this is some of your last opportunity, maybe first opportunity as well as last opportunity to see it. Um, but we will have our April talk on uh, affordable housing in New York City and its history by Matt Lasner and Nicholas Bloom, and that's on April 19th. And then stay, stay tuned on our website to the other upcoming programs. Um, and by the end of this month, we'll be opening an exhibition on the Singapore architects, Woha, um, in, uh, who do skyscrapers and public housing and a whole range of, of uh, skyscraper tropical towers um, that have, t have a very different take on the skyscraper typology than the Western um, steel, concrete, curtain wall, climatized um, um, you know, type of, of tall building. So, so that's a little bit of, of what we do um, here at the museum. And we, um, but we like to alternate between this kind of contemporary show and what really is my first love as a historian um, of New York and of American architecture, the history of New York, the urban history of New York and how it evolves. And 
of course, here in lower Manhattan, and especially over on the East River side, there's the, the heart of the colonial settlement, the beginning of the Port of New York that establishes the economy, the kind of great generative economy that makes us um, the capital, eventually the capital of the world, you could even say that, but one of the great maritime centers um, of, uh, of American power. So, um, and that history um, still remains in the built fabric over uh, Skirmahorn Row and the whole landmarked area of South Street Seaport. And of course, the, the museum is, is dedicated to that history at the same time that it has this kind of double identity as a maritime museum and a, and a place to, to, to um, um, preserve ships and that particular history. So there's a lot that goes over, on over there at the West Side. On, on the east side, and there certainly um, is a lot of history to the way um, that telling the story of the port, go ahead, yes. um, uh, has, uh, has transpired uh, to find, try to find a physical home and a permanent home um, in, over in that area of town. So that preservation story of the wonderful early 19th century architecture, the commercial counting houses, um, uh, is, um, is something that we, we all, as preservationists, should really want to hold dear and to make sure survives in order to tell, um, tell that story on the streets and in the, in the, in the skyline, because it's the low part of the skyline. Um, and um, James Lindgren has been telling that story in his um, excellent book um, that you already, you know, I'm sure you've seen now. Um, so preserving South Street Seaport and the dream and reality of New York's uh, of, of a New York urban renewal district because that's it, isn't it? The story of urban renewal is is self renewal all the time. It's the creative <laughs> destruction um, of the economy being, and of buildings being replaced by something else. And New York has been enormously successful um, in that regenerative uh, character that it's had. So, um, so there's a, a lot of history to preserve and protect, and um, Jim has, has really captured, and, and I've seen uh, all the, the slides in this PowerPoint, so I need to sit down really quickly because there's a really rich history that details and you know, chronicles um, the many iterations of the attempts to save and preserve that place. Um, so James Lindgren um, is a professor of history at, um, at you know, the State University of Plattsburgh, so he's come from upstate uh, in order to talk to us tonight, for which we greatly appreciate um, that effort. And um, he has done previous books, which I'll read the titles here, makes it easier. Um, Preserving Historic New England and Preserving Old Dominion. He, uh, as what he was explaining to me, is his interest is in historic preservation as well as in museums and has uh, been exploring especially in his publications, maritime museums, um, but across the board, the, the landmark districts that often house these various kinds of museums. So um, first among equals, it seems to me, has to be South Street, Se South Street Seaport, and we hope it always remains that way, right? Okay, so Jim Lindgren.